Hey guys, still plenty of time left to donate to the charity of P-Flag. Remember, this month is about giving back and helping kids like Nex Benedict. And if you or someone you know feels like you don't belong, just remember, you are loved, you are wanted, and you got this. Now on with the video. And I hate to waste a good spotlight. <clears throat> you see a lot, Dr. Lecter. But are you strong enough to point that high-powered perception at yourself? Well, that was good. Wow, this dude has a warehouse full of personas. It's inspiring. Hi, I'm Kitty Monk, and I'm here to talk to you about American Dad. Or more specifically, Roger and his disguises. Now, one of the most notable parts of American Dad is Roger. And, of course, his personas. In fact, I've already made several videos on the subject. The Fox era of American Dad establishes the idea of Roger's personas. And they provided plenty of good ones. Many good ones. But for the sake of fairness, let's make it 15. However, there are some ground rules. First off, to be eligible, it has to be a persona that's named in the episode. Second, they can't be based on a pre-existing person or character. So like, no Kevin Bacon, no Klaus, but that still leaves us with plenty of personas. Oh, and no honorable mentions. So, let's discuss. Starting with... In nature, a horse will not offer you his hoof until you gain his trust. Go ahead, open your eyes. Hello. I'm Clip Clop. Clip Clop. It's friggin' Clip Clop, guys. I mean, uh, Clip Clop. Widowmaker has Francine realized that her and Stan don't communicate, especially compared to another CIA couple. And it's hard to argue she's wrong. Hi, Stan. Hi. How was work? Fine. Anything exciting happen? That's confidential. Dinner? Monday night football. See you in bed. Francine insists that she and Stan go to couples therapy. With Roger, obviously. Way cheaper. Plus he's not a hypnotist. And as a trust exercise, he uses a new persona, who isn't Dr. Penguin or Madam Buttercup. And to do that, you must communicate from your heart. Go ahead, open your eyes. Let's see who can earn my hoof, shall we? <gasps> I know I can. To earn his hoof, one must earn his trust. Get it? It's symbolic. To understand your spouse, you need to trust them. And animals are the perfect subject for that. Much like children, they can smell if you're evil or not. Francine is able to successfully get Clip Clop's hoof by gently petting him. Will you honor me with your hoof? Stan, get the camera! Stan, on the other hand, isn't as successful, nor does he realize the politically correct terms for horse anatomy. Give me your foot. It's a hoof, and you have to earn it. Give me your damn hoof! The exercise fails, but it did accomplish one thing. It allowed Clip Clop to enter our hearts forevermore. Plus, also for Stan to open up to Dr. Penguin, but watch the rest of the episode. Miss, can you control your little girl because I- Oh, you are not telling me how to raise my child! You do not tell this woman how to raise her child! You do not tell her how to raise me! I couldn't go through the list without including her, I'm sorry. We all know that booze is one of Roger's biggest joys in life. Booze is another synonym for alcohol. Not those things you stuff into bras. But this, of course, makes it difficult when he disguises himself as younger people. In Home Drone, Roger goes with Francine, Stan, and Haley to tour colleges, and his persona this time around is Caitlin Smith, the youngest Smith. Her middle name is Miracle. With Roger dressed as little Caitlin here, we can all pre-board. My middle name is Miracle, because I was born attached to a dead twin who had a second butt where its mouth was supposed to be. Okay then. On the plane, Roger tries to order a drink, but because his persona is a child, the flight attendant of course refuses. And to make matters worse, the plane is stuck at the gate, meaning Roger is both sober and he's got a delayed flight. I'm dying. Franny, I want you to take over my Blimpies franchise. You'll run it right! The horror! Roger tries to get around this by dressing up as Stan, complete with freak chin, and he gets his drink. Sweetheart, I'll have a mango teeny, shaken, not stirred. Stirred. Is that how I say it? Stirred. Why are you still here? 
scared. But Caitlin's disappearance is noticed by an air marshal, who refuses to let the plane take off until she's found. And Roger refuses to switch back because of commitment. Where is my little angel? Hold me back, like Sean Penn in Mystic River. Is that my daughter in there? No, no, hold them back. Is that my daughter? No, hold them. Is that my... Your Eventually, Roger relents. <gasps> they found her! Aw, what I find ironic is that, like usual, Roger takes the long way out. Because when you really think about it, he didn't have to do any of this. He could have had Francine order the drink for him, but maybe he was afraid someone would notice. Still, the principal... Roy Rogers McFreely is the name, chairing the homeowners associations, my game. Yes, I know what you're thinking, but the jacket is vintage. You won't be able to find one anywhere. In Roy Rogers McFreely, Stan is living my worst nightmare, participating in a homeowners association. <gasps> An above ground sprinkler on the front lawn? No, sir! At times like this, I'm glad I have an apartment. Like, I've been to the lie that is Salem, Massachusetts, and that town looks like the HOA reigns supreme. Stan uses the HOA and the block watch to enforce his rules on the neighborhood, because he's the man. Lately, Roger has been disappointed that Stan won't listen to him, or buy him the ingredients for a Roy Rogers. OMG, I love their mashed potatoes. You don't need grenadine. Yes, I do. It goes in cola to make a Roy Rogers. Rogers. I had a Roy Rogers once. Hated it. Won't have it in my house. That and cilantro. So he makes up a persona to challenge Stan as head of the HOA, Roy Rogers McFreely. Wait, does he have two last names or just the one? Gotta stop smoking salvia before I go to the body painting place. I ain't fading, no ghost. Roger uses the HOA to get back at Stan, allowing all exemptions until the neighborhood looks like something out of Dr. Seuss. Oh, God, non-native ornamental grasses. Steve, don't look! A small but determined splinter group ends up challenging Roger and his tyrannical grip on the neighborhood, which I don't even think is that bad. But he does do horrible things like forcing an agoraphobic to sit in the backyard. Hello, morons. I think it's time for speakerphone to get a little fresh air. Guys, they're taking me out on the veranda! Oh, God! As it turns out, Roger only did this to get a say. <clears throat> you should have bought the grenadine. It was on the list! It was unnecessary. You think everything I want is unnecessary? Stan, you're such a dumbass. Just get him the stupid drink. You're a bad man, Larry! Go sit on a ham sandwich with mustard! <laughs> if you couldn't guess by my numerous jokes and my selfie with Abby Cadabby in SeaWorld, my real name is Abigail, but I typically go by Abby, as in Apple Betty Igloo, not Apple Betty Boob Yogurt, because I'll be honest, I don't like my name. Abigail is an old lady name. Not because of here, just because of in general. <gasps> this one reminds me of Abigail Breslin. Not so much the way it looks, but it's energy. In Killer Vacation, each of the Smiths get their own plot line when they go on vacation to Hawaii. Ugh, Hallie's. I've always wanted to go, but I probably won't. I'm not really into beaches and political, social reasons aside. It's like a nine-hour plane ride and a $500 ticket. Roger's plot line is that he's an old lady named Abigail Lemon Party. I'm Larry. Abigail. Abigail Lemon Party. I always laugh whenever I hear that name, but do not Google what a lemon party is. Just if anybody tries to question you, simply tell them it's a gathering where you gather and make lemonade as friends. Abigail Lemon Party recently lost her husband and is obviously grieving pretty hard. She went on this trip in order to find herself, which as somebody who travels a lot, I totally understand. And this was totally not to take advantage of pre-boarding. It's been a year since my husband Omar passed. I just need to get away from the apartment. All those memories. <laughs> While waiting at the hotel buffet, she meets an older gentleman named Larry. Larry seems cool. Not a gilf, but he has a good personality. This is my first vacation by myself since my wife departed. This is my first without Omar. Would you care for an echo wafer? Oh. 
Only Larry has a secret. He's wearing a colostomy bag, which is basically a bag full of poop. Hey, chin up. You're alive. It doesn't matter where your poop goes. Getting mine to go anywhere at all is a big to-do. And he soon ditches Abigail for a younger woman, jerk. Poor woman. Dementia's a terrible thing. Beat it, you old bag. So Roger gets revenge by dressing up as another persona and revealing the colostomy bag to Larry's new date. Well, that's a strange thing to carry around. I like to leave mine in the toilet. Shall we? Closure given, Abigail spreads her husband's ashes, finally ready to move on. I know what you did to our kids, you monster! The reason I like this persona is... I'm biased because it's probably my favorite persona, just by virtue of name. Abby Roan, eh, I guess that one's good too, but Abigail Lemon Party just sounds the funniest for obvious reasons. I actually thought about cosplaying as her, but I'm afraid nobody's gonna know who I am. And Rachel McFarlane, to my knowledge, isn't going to any big cons near me, so one day. Who's that? Oh, don't worry about him. That's just a nobody who lives in the basement. <gasps> a nobody? <laughs> who farted? Nobody! <laughs> why can't Roger be my daddy? If it were true, I could totally understand why he went out for cigarettes and never came back. American Stepdad, C stands for Stepfather Hercules Die. Somehow, I'm guessing he did not properly celebrate Spanakopita, and Augustus St. Cloud stole his life. Stan insists that his mother, Betty, should come to live with the family. Well, insist is the wrong word. It's more like he forces her. Well, I gotta go. Gotta get to work. See you tonight. What are we doing? This is crazy. Anything to retreat to a safe place between her mommy milkers. His words, not mine. Stan forces Roger to move into the basement. Trust me, I used to do all of my videos in a basement. That place sucks. While his mother takes over the attic. And the whole time, he makes it clear that he doesn't consider Roger family the same way he would with Francine or Steve. This is my home. You can't do this. Sorry, bro. Mom's family. But I'm family too! You just called me bro! Sorry cuz, I was just using it as slang. This is when Roger is using his new persona, Tom Yabo, a yoga instructor. Sean Ian, I'm just gonna adjust your arm to the right a bit. How does that feel? Good? Good. Okay, now I'm just gonna put my thumb in your mouth. How does that feel? Good. Mere days, if not hours, after Betty's arrival, Tom and her get married. Which makes Stan rightfully assume it's because Roger wants to get his attic back. You married my mother just to get your attic back! Why on earth would I want my attic back if it meant having to share it with some old lady I didn't even love? And honestly, part of me feels this way even if Roger spends the whole episode swearing that's not true. Like, I could totally buy he just went after Betty to get the attic back, but then he actually fell in love with her. However, it's funny to see Roger rub his stepdaddy privileges in Stan's face. So Stan, how was work today? Fun. Stan? You speak up and look at Tom when he asks you a question. It was fine, okay? Ugh, how dare he be nice. However, it seems like Stan and Roger, for the first time ever, actually do get along, as Roger puts his father skills to the test. Which makes sense. Look at how many of his personas have kids. My, my dad never taught me about tools. I could teach you. If you'd let me. I'll teach you how to do that, too. Roger and Betty decide to go on a honeymoon to Niagara Falls. Hope they went on the Canadian side. There's nothing on the American side. I've been there. However, it seems like Stan's suspicions are correct because Roger's computer implies he's going to kill Betty and get a huge insurance payout. He's getting another toggle coat? Stan goes to stop them, only it turns out... I'm trying to kill him! Um, what the hell?! I told you I wanted to be independent, so I took out a life insurance policy on Tom. So you couldn't just talk to Stan or put your foot down? Yeah, I'm not the biggest fan of Betty. Ugh, her and Tilly from King of the Hill. However, to make sure everybody wins, Roger fakes his death and goes back home. I don't have to be in my family to be my family. Dude, seriously? I really wish I'd known before I let go! Oh, it's nice they bonded. Now, Will. Things between us will go back to the way they usually are next week. I sure hope so. <sighs> Rats.
Uh, can we please get a bullet intern to make sure I always have bullets? We had one? What happened to her? Oh, that's right. She went back to school. Which fictional cartoon character do you get your news from? Comment down below. Roger is a lot of things, and intelligence is not one of them. No wonder he went into journalism. All they need is a pretty face. I should do journalism. Haley has started an internship with newscaster Genevieve Vance, who was basically Nancy Drew, but... Roger. However, she can't get any views. Her only real competitor is a Taiwanese prayer breakfast. I'm Genevieve Vance. Tonight on News Glance, is heroin the new cure for cancer? What I don't know about things will shock you. She promises Haley that if she can get her a juicy story, she'll allow her to do an expose on Garbage Island. M most people like to get wasted on an exotic island, but this island is waste. I'm sorry. I can't do this. Isn't she a trooper? I think Marshall Erickson tried to do something similar. To this end, Haley makes up a bogus story about Steve being kidnapped. Stunningly gorgeous high school student Steve Smith has gone missing. Missing. All we know right now is that Steve was last seen at home with his family, and he is adorable. Wow, I cannot believe American Dad did an episode on missing white woman syndrome. While the episode is primarily about Haley and Steve, that doesn't mean Genevieve isn't around. She makes up a vigil for Steve, hosts nonstop coverage, and makes up a video of Stan and Francine murdering Steve, starring her. <laughs> Forgive you. <laughs> Class A journalism, even if it gets the both of them arrested. The best part is how she later pins the blame on Haley. It all comes full circle, and Steve goes along with it to get some tail. Genevieve Vance is right! My sister kidnapped me! Steve? Well, maybe he and Roger really do deserve each other. But at least Haley clears her name and Genevieve's media empire comes crashing down. Like beer water does through my small intestine whenever I drink it. We have to take a break. <laughs> beer water. It won't give you diarrhea. Would I have given you such a wonderful birthday present? No. In English, please. No. Martin Sugar rests, y'all. <laughs> I think this guy explains why Roger has never gotten into legal trouble. Will that, or if Max Jets is anything to go by, he just sneaks out and makes it look like his personas are asleep. As we learn, Stan is obsessed with jury duty, even putting his name in the box voluntarily and sequestering himself. Let me see what we got. I can put you on a multiple felony trial that starts tomorrow. Olivia, you're guilty of making my day. <laughs> Although apparently, at least in Virginia, if you tell a courthouse you want to do jury duty, they legally can't let you, since it counts as a bias. I should keep this in mind when I have to do jury duty later this month. The trial Stan gets is for a man named Martin Sugar, who ran a counterfeit handbag ring. As you can guess, this man with a pimp-style name is actually Roger. Hi. Stan. Stan. Just, just, just look over here, just for a sec. Stan. Hi! Stan, you need to resign from the jury this instant. That's bias. What happened to following the law and being an American? Because I'm not spoiling anything, yes, Roger is 100,000% guilty and a cruel man. He makes pregnant women on the assembly line give birth and then get right back to work. That's why he built the Martin Sugar Daycare Center. It's an overturned refrigerator filled with kitty litter. Yeah, at least it's better than chaining them to the radiators like my parents did to me. No, 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 they never did that. They locked me in closets. Nah, I'm kidding about that too. None of our closets have locks. Roger beats the allegations by following the OJ method, being charming and indulging in the Chewbacca defense. Do you admit that this is you? I will, if you admit this is you. What? Well, how, how did you? Look how happy you are. That does not make sense. But it does fool 11 out of 12 people, including the prosecution. However, because juries kinda have to be unanimous, and Stan is the foreman, they are forced to vote guilty. You are sentenced to 10 years in maximum security prison. <laughs> 
I can't believe he got me. Roger, come on. I thought you cosplayed as Velma Kelly. Surely you could have hired Billy Flynn. Stuff happens and Roger is able to evade the law by ditching the Martin Sugar disguise for something else and getting called in for jury duty. Dr. Lawrence Feldman, I want to report for jury duty. Eight in the morning? Is that like a hard eight or can I roll in around noon? <sighs> fine. I know, I'm not a morning person either. I totally don't want to do jury duty. Meaning Stan gets arrested in his place and the tables are turned. I'll vote guilty if you want me to. Of course you will. Hi. Arma. Stan doesn't like dinner parties. Well, I don't know who this Stan yet is, but you're married to Professor Jordan Edelstein, PhD, and he fancies a dinner party. Probably one of Roger's first official personas, meaning it's one of his most influential because it sets the stage for what's to come. Even if his first persona was technically Haley Smith, burn victim, Kim Brufugi was the episode that finally introduced us to personas. I find role-playing helps me cope with the soul-crushing boredom around this place. May I proceed? Uh, okay. Shut your hole, crazy broad! Until then, Roger either hid himself around humans, or he just wore clothes and hoped for the best. Or he wore clothes but came up with excuses, like going to the beach as a Saudi exchange student, hence him completely covering himself. Here, Roger starts to properly do personas and teams up with Francine when Stan and the kids travel to Africa. Okay, remember, I'm Professor Jordan Edelstein. My key stats, IQ 140, nearsighted- and I'm Amanda Lane. I didn't take your name. But I do like this because down the line, they do, like, personas together. Like how they pretend to be widows. What makes Roger funny in this episode is his insistence to details. Roger wants to be a political science professor, but Francine suggests it should be economics. You should be an economics professor. What? No, I make my own backstory. Besides, I freaking hate economics. Fine. If you want to waste your life with political science, go ahead. No, Franny, it's political science. Daffy Duck was a professor in political science. It gets worse when they invite another couple over to the house and Francine accidentally says that Roger is economics. I told you, I don't study economics. I'm a political scientist. That's right. Oh well, too late now. I said economics. It's been established. So this leads into a game of the pair trying to one-up each other by making up embarrassing details. Before you went to rehab. I never went to rehab! You have now. It's been established. Because it's been established. Until... Tell them how you killed our baby, Amanda. Jordan, no! Best line in the whole episode, if not the whole show. Hands down. But come on now. Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? I am. Because I think she might be me one day. Writing complicated crap that only makes sense for undergrad students. What, you thought I meant the mental break? I'm too weak to hold a rock and none of my clothes have pockets. Now, if we're talking about Sylvia Plath, she's the reason I'm scared of gas stoves. Her and her husband's second wife. That's enough of that. Steve, honey, finish pushing that onto the floor for me. Good boy, here's a hundo. While the Smith family can generally see for Roger's disguises, as can the occasional side character, the point is made that not everybody has this privilege. I mean, I made a video about it with Dan the Man, where we talked about 10 characters who could very well be Roger personas that the audience cannot see through. While many people believe it's just a stupid headcanon, Stanny Tendergrass is the first episode to establish the idea. Every summer, the CIA slows down, and they basically let their workers go on summer break. Stan therefore takes a job as a groundskeeper at a country club, with the intention of saving up enough money to afford a membership. It's a thankless job, but there is one perk, employee swim. Ooh, is that where the girls ask the guys? No, once a month, the club gives us an hour early in the morning to swim in the pool, right before they drain it. <laughs> Ugh, I used to work at one of those condo buildings, and we had a pool, and the employees never got to swim in there, but we got to use the gym, especially when it was closed to the residents during the shutdown, and it had a private bathroom, so I can't totally complain. One of the patrons is Mr. Vanderhill, who is actually Roger. It's Vanderhill! <laughs> a bird distracted me on my backswing. It was going, kick, kick, kick! 
That's not my name, and it was saying it right at me. Yes, yes Mr. Mr. Vanderhill. But instead of telling Roger Roth or something like that, Stan just ignores him. It's almost as if he can't recognize him. Roger? Hey! Why didn't my dad recognize you? Oh, everyone in the family has one persona they can't see through. I said it before, and I'll say it again. Part of me feels like Roger does his personas, not only so he can interact with the world, but to lord over the rest of the family. I'll tell you what I think. I think you hide behind all these disguises so you don't have to face the fact that the real you is an inconsiderate jerk. Especially Stan, who treats him the worst out of everybody. And it's hilarious here. But how did Roger get all that money? Enough to afford a membership to a club that has a $200,000 ticket price? As it turns out, Roger pulled an Anna Nicole Smith and married a rich woman shortly before her passing and stealing all of his daughter's inheritance. Her daughter was not thrilled. You're never gonna get your mom's money, Pamela! Huh, maybe this explains Max Jets. But something I do like about this persona is how Roger is able to be annoying to Stan and get away with it until the ending. And how Steve never tells his father the truth. Also, before we get to the next section, is Vanderhill based on Nicholas Vanderbilt? I think that's his name? Like, the college? Dear, my ears aren't working so well. I got AIDS in prison. Hearing aids. I should really use them. Then I might have heard that guy who snuck up on me in the shower and gave me HIV. Probably my all-time favorite Roger persona, but not his best. Typically, the Smiths are the only people who can see through Roger's personas and just treat him like Roger. But there are times where they're willing to play along. Can't believe you guys always go along with this Max Jets charade. It's just Roger dressed up in another one of his stupid outfits. Yeah, but this character's loaded. Max Jets is my favorite. The Smiths have been living frugally as of late, and to help them, Roger announces that his richest persona is coming home from prison, Max Jets. I give you a hint. He's rich, he's obnoxious, and he loves showering this family with gifts and cash. Max Jets? To put it out there, Max Jets is a total SOB, but he's pretty generous to the family and always showers them with cash, so they look the other way, even if he likes to vote with Francine and Steve, but hey, whatever you gotta do for money. Stan? Aren't you tired of washing your face after every time you blow your nose? Let him vote! <laughs> oh, Max! Click. At least until he gets a new girlfriend, a waitress named Gina, and decides to become her sugar daddy at the expense of the Smiths. We've been together ever since. Exclamation point! Look at that, we're already finishing each other's sentences. Well, providing punctuation, but that's... A start! Hey! hey! OMG, he's like the grandpa from the boondocks. And Gina... I ain't saying she's a gold digger. Catherine, you can't say that word, even in a song. The Smiths try to tell Roger that his new gal pal is a gold digger, but he refuses to listen and goes ahead with marriage. Which piece do you want? You know. Idiot. Gina swears that she's a good person, even signing a prenup, even if all signs point to her digging for gold. At the wedding, he dies. The Smiths are thrilled as they get his fortune, but as it turns out, he left his money to his son. Jerry Jets. What? what? Who's that? Me. Of course. What's funny is that this entire episode was just an elaborate plotline between Jerry and Gina. Then Gina put poison in the cake and fed it to my dear old dad. Damn it! I signed the prenup so no one would suspect me. And when Gina finally got Jerry and his money, she murdered her new husband with an oar. Are you... The Piñata Man? See. As we all know, part of being in disguise is acting, or playing a role, or pretending to be someone who is not you. And all of these are synonyms of acting. In a piñata named Desire, Stan and Roger get into a fight as to who is the better actor, especially after Roger bombs an audition. Anything you can do, I can do better. I can do anything better than you. Now you can! Yes, I can! Now you can! Yes, I can! Yes, I can! Now you can! 
Yeah, no offense, it's Roger. I'm not being biased because this is his video. I just think he is because he can juggle so many lives at once. Maybe he's not good at professional acting, but neither is Stan. Stan has no street smarts and he got kidnapped by radical members of the Occupy movement. Stan does try to take acting lessons from one of Roger's other personas and in the process ends up stealing a role Roger coveted, the Pinata Man. I'd also like to thank my acting teacher who unknowingly trained me to steal this part right out from under him making me the better actor and once again the big dog. Well, Roger only manages to get a bit part. Roger tries to make the best out of a bad situation. Would the senor and senorita like to hear about the nacho especial? Cut! You don't have any lines! Stop improvising! I need to be heard! However, on opening night, the lead calls in sick, along with her standby, and this leads to Roger getting the part, under the persona of Clichon Montague. Everyone meet Clichon Montague. Diamonds, diamonds, friends, and men, diamonds. You know, I gotta say, she's actually kind of hot. Granted, it does kind of resemble me, what with the childbearing hips, giant thighs, wanting to have guys lift her up like Regina George, curly hair, and Latino origins. Maybe I'm a tad biased. What follows is one of the funniest sequences in American Dead, where Roger and Stan spend the entire play trying to one-up another as actors, and the audience eats it up. Cause I'll be breaking and making and taking your heart. You've been shaking and faking and snaking from the start. While hilarious, it gets worse. At first, it's just Roger and Stan overacting. Then we get the big climax, a love scene, where the leads have to make out. You won't be able to kiss me, the play will go off the rails, and once and for all it will be clear that I'm the better actor! While it's Roger's dream come true, let's be honest, Stan is pretty vanilla, except for that one time with Terry. At first, Stan feels a little reluctant, but... You call that acting? <coughs> this is acting! <coughs> once again, they try to one-up each other in various gross ways, until we finally get... I'm acting the crap out of you. Public indecency? We weren't really doing it, we were just acting. If it makes you feel any better in the DVD version, he actually lifts up Roger's skirt and then we see Roger going like back and forth, so take that as you will. On the bright side, this gets Stan and Roger arrested for public indecency, which while y'all are probably familiar with Lauren Boebert, it still proves they're pretty good actors. And Haley was right all along. Sydney, this is Roger Smith. Prepare to have your life destroyed. That gentleman has the wrong Sydney. Or he's dyslexic and angry at Disney. Roger can biologically not be nice. If he isn't acting like a jerk, it will literally kill him. E.T. style. That's when Sydney comes in. Roger tries to make a purchase at a gas station only for his credit card to get declined because some random nobody named Sydney Huffman charged a huge purchase. Uh, Sydney Huffman. Co-signer? I never authorized a co-signer. Sir. I can't have you lying on the floor and making phone calls. Roger tries to crack down on Sidney and ruin his life, such as getting him fired from his job as a Bible salesman, telling his girlfriend, Audrey, I mean, I know her name is Judy, but she looks like Audrey from Little Shop of Horrors, that he has more diseases than a medical waste bin, raping his tree. I mean, he just, uh... Yeah, the guy raped a tree. Turning his pigeon friends into chicken wings and finally destroying his most irreplaceable, precious things. Your possessions! OMG, the horror. Actually, this happened to me once. However, before Roger goes through with it, it turns out... I'm the sap. I'm Sydney. One of my personas has taken on a life of its own! What a twist. Yes, Sidney is actually a genuinely nice person. And to be fair, he doesn't deserve everything that happened. Like, I wouldn't mind having a beer with this guy, even if he cannot partake in the devil's nectar. Eh, I guess soda. With his life ruined, Sidney had to do something unholy and hire a hitman. But why did Roger, the most evil character in the show, make this dude? Well, it's quite a story. One morning, Roger found a pair of gloves, but before he could shoplift them, he found out they were in a case, and the only key was with Judy. All 
I want in this life is a good-hearted, employed, sober fella who treats me nice. Well, are you a good-hearted, employed, sober fella? So he pretended to be Sydney in order to win her trust. Wait, you spent 700 bucks just to steal $10 gloves? Shut up! It's the principal, Sydney. Jeez. But once he saw that Judy was going to be fired because of him, he felt bad. Something he could not bear, so he ended up creating Sydney. Something in me split, and a part of me that cared about Judy was born. Sydney. Roger tells Sydney that if he calls off the hit, he'll let him live. And after Sydney agrees. Oh, cheese and crackers! Sorry, Sid. You're a good egg. And that cramps my style. No, Roger, why? This actually hurts. Speaking of, I wonder what this scene was to the people outside. Like, was Roger just talking to himself? Was this all in his head? I don't know if I think I get kitty stuff. Okay, I'll go to the next section. Oh, you can throw a knife. But you know what you can't throw? A party for my birthday which was Wednesday. <laughs> I remember years. To be fair, this one isn't technically Roger, or at least our Roger, but I can totally see this being Roger in a different timeline. Upset he couldn't become an actor, and instead he becomes a supervillain and a titular character. Make me feel good. Make me feel good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the producers laugh too. So, it makes the list. Tear Jerker, if you're unaware, is an American Dead AU episode, kind of like West of Mexico, where Stan is a James Bond type hero who often goes against Roger, aka Tear Jerker. Tear Jerker is usually assisted in his schemes by a variety of henchmen, like Manny and Petty, aka Greg and Terry, or Tchotchke Smear, aka Klaus. And finally, Sex Pum to Come, Francine. Tear Jerker could not act to save his life, and he never got any serious parts, so he became a villain and swore to make a movie that would cause people to cry themselves to death, literally. And they will cry and die. Pie? You can't have any. To this end, he teams up with Tchotchke to replace celebrities with robots, who happen to be weak against any milk-based products, including milkshakes. Ah! Oh! What did you do? Was there milk in that coffee? McConaughey can't have milk! My milkshake brings all the boys to the yard. And then use said robots to make horrible movies, which means that people will have no choice but to see Tear Jerker's magnum opus, Oscar Gold, an Anne Frank-style movie, which, eh, you know what, maybe it's better if I just show you. I want to drive the truck! I want to drive the truck! Oscar, no, be quiet! Vim, vim. Oh, and he and Peter are on the same wavelength. Your son is mentally rested. <laughs> what does that mean, Doctor? It means he'll never not be <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would make a joke about this, but Roger was the one who wrote the movie, and he doesn't give a crap about political correctness. Well, a very evil plan that nearly succeeds in killing everybody who is an Iranian, there's something Tear Jerker did not count on. Celebrity babies. As Tear Jerker kept a handful alive, and people went home to see photos of them, his plan does not succeed. Tears! Drop! Really? Oh, and BTW, Tear Jerker has a horrible contractor who I'm certain was probably a mole for the CIA and did all this to kill him. Tear Jerker tries to escape, planning to release a movie of... I've written another film and it's even sadder than Oscar Gold. It's six hours of a baby chimp trying to revive its dead mother. But he falls into a volcano and dies. Mike, you're the worst contractor ever! Or does he? Unlike most AU episodes, this one got a sequel, for black eyes only, where Sex Pun is killed on their honeymoon by Principal Lewis, aka Black Villain. And as it turns out, Tear Jerker is still alive. He's dead! Why would you think that? Because he fell in a volcano. 
As long as you fall the right way, a volcano can never hurt you. Everyone knows that, even babies. Yeah, I knew that, totally. Tear Jerger and Stan have to team up against Black Villain, as both hate his guts. But Tear Jerger can help acting like a villain. I'll save you, Chachki! <laughs> Tear Jerger, same side! Right, right, damn it, sorry. Until he eventually double crosses Stan. <clears throat> Tear Jerker, same side! No, not this time. This time it's a double cross. <laughs> However, a battle happens and Tear Jerker dies. Or does he? <laughs> I survived a volcano! You don't think I can survive this? I don't know. Because they haven't made another Tear Jerker episode in forever. No, I totally forgot about this episode until it came time to make the list. If only because I feel like they could reference it in the show or explain where it comes from. I do subscribe to the AU theory, but there are times when we see Tear Jerker in main episodes, which makes me wonder, did all of this really happen? Was it like a LARP? or the Book of Fisher, but I do want to do a bigger review of the episode one day, so broad strokes. Tear Jerker, however, is still one of the best personas. He's just Roger as a James Bond villain, and I could appreciate that. Good as new. Don't go into shock. Today's not about you. Okay, everyone. Genie Guild, wedding planner, and a survivor, and an escort in Hispanic countries. It's weird to think she's probably Roger's sanest persona. When Francine and Stan decide to renew their wedding vows, they hire Genie Gold, wedding planner. Genie Gold, wedding planner, is the best at the game. She has a million backup plans, is highly resourceful, and a film crew in the form of her two adult sons. Wait, how does she have sons? I know. I I look too young to have kids in college. We are the music makers. We are the dreamers of dreams. That is an unsatisfying answer. Heck, at one point, she evers Francine and discovers that Francine hummed a song she wishes she could have walked down the aisle to, and she uses that as the song at the re-wedding. The only problem is the people around her are gigantic idiots. Haley and Steve want to get their parents a crappy gift, as in a card. <laughs> The boy is to die first. Whereas Stan and Francine keep canceling weddings as they're actively in progress. Several thousand dollars down the toilet, they eventually decide to salvage it by holding it at Pizza Overlord. Oh my god, that's like my dream wedding. Well, that in a courthouse. It's awesome sauce, and it's all thanks to Jeannie Gold's wedding planner. I'll spread them out over here in the sun. Help yourselves. Everyone having a good time? Best wedding ever, right? I'm ruined. What makes Jeannie Gold, wedding planner, so great is not only her attention to detail, but her two adult sons. I had no budget left. I went to the party store and bought the leftover Thanksgiving decorations from the half price bin. I think you did a great job, Mom. I did when I made you. I wonder if this means Roger gave birth to them, brainwashed them, or adopted them. Knowing Roger, maybe is Valik, he killed the real Genie Gold and replaced her. On the bright side, she's also one of Roger's most recurring personas. She came back in Persona Assistant because she's the only person able to take down her archenemy and brother, Ricky Spanish. So many things make sense now. Your reign of terror ends now! Wait, does this mean her maiden name is Jeannie Spanish? I said you're overthinking it! I said I was sorry, jeez. It's Ricky Spanish! It's Ricky Spanish! Yes, get Ricky Spanish! He's the only one this angry mob should be after! Ricky Spanish. Yes, every time you bring up this persona, you must say his name just like that. In the episode, Ricky Spanish. Roger discovers a persona he hasn't worn in a while, who, to put it out there, looks like a D-bag who just rolled out of bed. Like, I'll be honest, sometimes I wear PJs when I go out, but only to pick up my prescription, or go to the corner store, or McDonald's. Am I really gonna wear my Sunday best just to buy Fritos? But I at least put on deodorant and brush my teeth. As it turns out, Ricky Spanish. 
Bush is Roger's most evil persona, and knowing Roger, that means a lot. He's harmed everybody in Langley Falls one way or another, and he's committed various crimes. Roger wants to destroy the persona, but Steve tries to get him to change his ways and become a better person. But all it does is make a butterfly slowly suffocate. Oh, sweetie. Butterflies only live about nine months. And Steve's innocence is shattered as he goes to prison in Ricky Spanish's place. I think what makes Ricky Spanish so terrifying is that he's partially Roger's doing and partially a hypnotic spell. All it takes to be possessed by Ricky Spanish is by putting on the clothes. In Persona Assistant, Stan temporarily takes over Roger's disguises when he's ill, and he ends up destroying the town. So Klaus convinces him to put on the Ricky Spanish outfit, not truly knowing who it is. Ricky Spanish. Ricky Spanish is back! And it's all thanks to Klaus. Who's your least favorite character now, Reddit? Sorry, that episode, Stan was occupied with Tunji. Is there any chance you're gonna surprise us and be the Prince of Zamunda? None. And even Genie Gold wasn't enough to beat him. But there is one other person, Roku Spanish. R Roku, did you make that little Ricky Spanish outfit all by yourself? That is so clever. He's clearly very advanced. Yep, Ricky Spanish. Might not be my absolute favorite, but I can't deny he makes Kevin Ramage look like a toothpick. Also, I think he was in Bub Kiss by Pete Davidson. Did you get another Roger the Alien tattoo? Yeah, Ricky Spanish. Can't keep getting tattoos put on, put back off. Yep, that totally tells you how expansive he is. Is it over? Yes. Are we going to be okay? Yes. Do you think maybe the baby couldn't have drowned in the pool? She sank like a stone. You have to live with that for the rest of your life. 